Teja. In this video, I'm going to cover the entire topic of coronavirus within a short span of time. Uh, so don't skip the video. Try to watch till end, such that you will get an overall brief idea regarding corona infection. Covid infection is a zoonotic disease, that is, humans get infection from animals. Before going to Covid infection, let us have a look at the classification of coronavirus. Coming to the classification, just look at the slide back to me. Coronavirus comes under order Nidovirales, family coronaviridae, subfamily coronavirales and genus into four, four different types like alpha, beta, gamma and delta. Overall, the seven major types of coronavirus that are going to cause infection for humans falls under category alpha and beta genus only. And these beta genus is further classified into lineages like A, B, C, D. Out of seven, the four which are mentioned in the blue box are going to cause mild upper respiratory tract infection by common cold only. But whereas the one which are mentioned in, in, in the red box that is SARS-CoV, MERS coronavirus, 2019 N-CoV. Initially, we named it as novel coronavirus, but later, uh, around 11th March 2020, I think, uh, WHO have been declared the name as SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2. All these three are going to cause acute respiratory distress syndrome in humans. Mm, let us look into the past uh, of various corona outbreaks. 2002 by SARS-CoV, 2002 by MERS-CoV, and in 2019 by SARS-CoV-2 uh, novel coronavirus. See, there is a lot of difference between uh, SARS-CoV-1 pandemic and SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. The infection rate here is very much low compared in comparison to SARS-CoV-2. See, why, why this has been happened? Whereas in case of SARS-CoV-1, uh, the patient get infected by SARS-CoV-1 virus and after the onset of symptoms, after the onset of symptoms, the chance of spreading to the other person is more, whereas in case of SARS-CoV-1. As a result of which, whenever the patient gets infected and uh, there is onset of symptoms, he or herself get isolated. So there is no much rapid spread in the community. Whereas in case of SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, uh, recent pandemic, uh, the before onset of symptoms, uh, the patient is within the incubation period, maximum one or two days before onset of symptoms, the spreading nature to other person is very much more. So the person moves here and there, uh, there is rapid spread in the community as a result of which. And one more difference uh, in SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 uh, in, in pathology point of view. Whereas in SARS-CoV-1, the inflammation, inflammation of alveolo is seen, the pathology. Whereas in SARS-CoV-2, uh, thromboinflammation. Apart from inflammation of alveoli, formation of thrombi has been seen. So uh, there is uh, inflammation, here is thromboinflammation, okay? Life cycle of coronavirus runs in three different hosts, primary, secondary and ultimate. For all three coronavirus, the primary host is bad. Ultimate host is humans and in and mode of spread, mode of transmission from primary to secondary, secondary to ultimate is by uh, direct contact. But whereas in humans, the ultimate host among us, not only direct contact but to other methods like uh, droplet spread and airborne. And some may say how airborne. See, whenever the patient cough or sneeze, uh, if the size of the particle is more than 5 microns, it can travel up to a distance of 4 to 3 to 4 feet. But if the size of the particle is less than 5 microns, it can travel more than 6 feet. So in places like rallies, public gatherings, we see airborne. And in hospitals, uh, mainly in ICU, uh, some patients are uh, intubated and some are on uh, you know, nebulization. So aerosols from the patient move all over ICU. So ICU is also a place for airborne spread. The name Corona has been given for those viruses which appear like a crown when we look under an electron microscope. SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus. The capsid is arranged in helical symmetry. The genome nucleic acid is single-stranded, linear, non-segmental, positive to sense RNA virus. And outside of the capsid we see an envelope. This envelope is having certain proteins like spike glycoprotein, E protein, M protein and apart from these proteins, certain other proteins in the virus like uh, uh, N protein, 16 NS proteins and these proteins are coded by their respective genes uh, like uh, spike glycoprotein by S gene, E protein by E gene, M protein by M gene and N protein by N gene and 16 NS protein by open reading frame gene. Why I am stressing these proteins and genes? 
why because these proteins acts as antigen and these antigens are targeted in rapid antigen test and these protein coding genes are targeted in real time pcr so proteins and genes are used as diagnostic purpose let us recollect some basic physiological points alveolar lung consists of three different types of cells type 1 pneumocyte which is responsible for exchange of gases type 2 pneumocyte uh, production of surfactant surfactant is essential for prevention of collapse of alveoli during expiration type 3 alveolar macrophages which are uh, which plays an important role in defense mechanism in general any host cell more particularly macrophages and some epithelial cells whenever they get infected leads to activation of toll like receptors 3 7 which are present located in endosome and rig 1 finally leads to production of interferons as a result of production of interferons the neighboring cells starts the defense mechanisms such that they prevent entry of virus into the cell to some extent just keep these uh, basic points in mind for some time and let us look at uh, pathology what is going on in covid infection initially the virus settles in the nasal epithelium and starts replicating as the time progresses it moves down and reaches alveoli in the alveoli the virus with spike glycoprotein attaches to the ACE2 receptor which is present located on the type 2 pneumocytes. Thereafter we see replication of virus starts. Uh, various steps in the replication of virus like uh, attachment, penetration, uh, uncoating, biosynthesis, assemble, maturation and finally exocytosis. During this process of viral replication in general the virus must be identified by the immune system and there must be an attack from the immune system but this doesn't happen in case of covid infection why because SARS-CoV-2 is a very smart virus uh, it hides its identity by two mechanisms firstly the virus creates certain pockets and replicates within the pockets such that it evades being picked up by cytoplasmic immune sensors and cannot be presented for HLA so there is a initially delay in adaptive immunity and second mechanism is the virus produces uh, certain proteins like NSP1V5, NSP7V5 and these proteins were going to inactivate toll like receptors and rig one as a result of which there is no production of interferons so there is no alerting signal for the other neighboring cells such that uh, virus can enter easily into the other cells as as time progresses most of the cells are get infected and a large number of viral copies and inflammatory cytokines are released out these inflammatory cytokines and viral copies are recognized by the alveolar macrophages and alveolar macrophages starts flaring up and produces inflammatory cytokines like interleukin 1 6 tnf alpha in covid infection we see there is a slight delay in adaptive immunity and dysregulation of innate immunity that is over expression of innate immunity as a, as a result of which we see cytokine storm the huge amount of cyto inflammatory cytokines are produced by alveolar macrophages so as a result of cytokine storm we see inflammation of alveoli next to alveoli the pulmonary capillaries which are surrounding alveoli undergo vascular changes like increase in vascular permeability and vascular vasodilation as a result of which the plasma leaks from the vessels into the interstitium leading to the interstitial edema then into the alveoli leading to the pulmonary edema as a result of pulmonary edema there is obstruction in the exchange of gases leading to the hypoxemia this hypoxemia triggers peripheral chemoreceptors these these chemoreceptors stimulates sympathetic system leading to the increase in heart rate in order to compensate hypoxemia these cytokines whenever they enter into the blood vessel they reach brain and in brain they stimulate hypothalamus leading to the fever apart from fever the effect of cytokine on blood vessel is vasodilation and increase in vascular permeability as a result of which there is drop in blood pressure so organs doesn't get enough perfusion so reduced perfusion leads to multi-organ failure and sepsis apart from this the cytokines through blood vessels reaches multiple organs leading to systemic inflammatory syndrome let us look at the pathology of thrombus formation due to the effect of uh, virus the endothelium loses 
its uh, anti thrombotic nature there are three steps in the formation of thrombus firstly the infected and the damaged endothelium more particularly the, the pericytes which are rich in ace2 receptors releases tissue factor leading to aggregation of ag aggregation and activation of platelets resulting in mild thrombocytopenia overall we see thrombus formation secondly neutrophil traps that is neutrophil produces certain granules in view of capturing virus so in this process neutrophils aggregate uh, forming an ideas like resulting in thrombus thirdly uh, complement activation and hypercoagulability sars cov2 inhibits or blocks factor h allows the complement system to get unregulated that is uh, activation of that leads to activation of complement and coagulation pathway leading to formation of thrombus so overall we see formation of thrombus and inflammation in covid infection uh, and uh, micro thrombi leads to formation of micro thrombi leads to micro angiopathy just have a look at which of triad summarize the overall pathology see in covid infection there is initial suppression of innate immunity and a transient delay in adaptive immunity as a result the virus multiplies to a very high number as there is no attack from immune set once the innate immunity recognizes the virus it starts fighting against virus in an unregulated manner alone that is uh, i mean over expression of innate immunity leading to cytokine storm resulting in thrombo inflammation just remember three words uh, that is dysregulation of innate immunity leading to th uh, cytokine storm resulting in thrombo inflammation that's it i pathology i mentioned that infected cells fail to produce interferons so this happens the dendritic cells in plasma identifies the filtered out rna particles from infected cells and produces interferons and the entire pathology what i explained is not going to happen in every individual and extent of pathology varies from individual to individual this extent of pathology depends upon factors like viral load presence and absence of interferons and timing of immune response so as per extent of pathology uh, clinical manifestation of covid is classified under three stages like mild moderate and severe very good initial immune response and production of interferons a majority of people who are infected with covid might fall under mild stage in mild stage the patient maintains saturation above 93% and his respiratory rate below 24 times per minute and he may experience certain symptoms like fever cough myalgia diarrhea body aches in cough 70% of people may experience dry cough and around 30% may have wet cough and in mild and moderate stage after onset of symptoms around 7 to 10 days the virus load starts declining whereas in case of severe stage after 15 days of onset of symptoms the viral load starts declining See in mild stage, see in moderate stage, the inflammation of alveolar starts. So the patient may experience dyspnea and he maintains saturation between 89% to 93% in presence of room air. And his respiratory rate uh, above 90, 24 times, between 24 times, between 24 to 30 times per minute. And in case of uh, severe stage, the thrombo inflammation starts leading to complications like multi organ failure. And uh, patient exp uh, patient may have saturation below 89% and his respiratory rate uh, beyond 30 times per minute. The timing of using various drugs in COVID management is very important. And in mild and moderate stage, and within first 15 days of severe stage, where uh, viral load is very high the use of antiviral drugs may show some benefits and in moderate and severe stage where the inflammation of alveolar starts the using of anti-inflammatory drugs may show some benefits and whenever you, you use anti-inflammatory drugs uh, within uh, mild stage and antiviral drug uh, in the late uh, severe stage there are no benefits and uh, coming to the antiviral drugs i don't want to touch each and every antiviral drug why because most of the antiviral drugs are dropped out from the list of COVID management. In mild stage, mostly we give symptomatic treatment. Apart from this symptomatic treatment, patient can use hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine acts by three different mechanisms uh, and it uh, prolongs QT interval. So never combine hydroxychloroquine with uh, azithromycin. Why? Because uh, as a result of these both drugs uh, you may see cumulative effect of QT prolongation so the patient may have some side effects like arrhythmias and prophylactic drug like ivermectin is the which is an important channel blocker 
dropped out from the list of COVID-19 management and in, in moderate stage we start giving the steroids and low molecular weight heparin in order to prevent thrombus complication and in this stage you never give combination of drug like uh, hydroxychloroquine with remdesivir why because whenever we use uh, together these drugs the efficacy of uh, remdesivir decreases the mechanism is not yet known but we should not prescribe these two drugs together and in uh, severe stage apart from these steroids and uh, remdesivir we start using anti interleukin 6 antagonist as a major drug the drug remdesivir an antiviral drug which is a nucleoside analog it inhibits rna dependent rna polymerase we see the exact benefit of using remdesivir only if you use it in moderate or within first 15 days from the onset of symptom in sim in severe stage and whenever you are giving remdesivir for patient you must check for his left hand or active why because remdesivir causes inflammation of liver so liver transaminase levels increases so the drug is contraindicated in two conditions that is whenever the liver transaminase levels increases four times more from the normal level and whenever the creatine clearance is less than 30 ml per minute and in severe stage apart from this steroids remdesivir low molecular weight heparin anti interleukin 6 antagonist tocilizumab plays an important role and in overall in covid infection remdesivir is a not drug of mortality benefit it is the only drug that reduces hospital stay the only drug which shows mortality benefit is steroid and whenever uh, we see uh, increase in levels of procalcitonin the patient must be put on antibiotics why because procalcitonin in indicates secondary bacterial infection now let us look at oxygen therapy the amount of air which moves in and out of lung during normal single breath is known as tidal volume that is around 5 to 8 ml per kg so let us roughly take as 6 ml per kg for example so for a 70 kg person it is around 70 into 6 that is 420, 420 ml per kg see uh, the respiratory rate of a normal adult individual is around 15 to 20 cycles per minute for example roughly we, should, we take 60 16 cycles so 16 into 420 that gives around 6720 ml per minute let us assume as 7 liters so roughly a normal individual takes uh, around 6 to 8 liters per minute for example in this case 6 li 7 liters so 7 liters of air he takes in and out of lung during single one minute during one minute uh, out of these seven liters uh, there is 79 percent of nitrogen and 21 percent of oxygen these oxygen percentage is enough in order to maintain normal saturation in a normal healthy individual but whereas in covid patient we see inflammation of alveoli there are three million alveoli if 15 percent are inflamed so leads to obstruction of gases exchange the rest of 85 percent maintain saturation whenever we provide extra raw material that is oxygen the patient able to maintain his saturation now let us look oxygen therapy there are four steps in oxygen therapy one ml of liquid oxygen gives 840 ml of gases oxygen and whenever you increase one liter of gases oxygen we see four percent increase in fio2 pao2 stands for partial pressure of arterial oxygen and fio2 stands for fraction of oxygen in spite and as per berlin's criteria depending upon the ratio of pao2 and fio2 it classified ards into uh, mild moderate and severe and in oxygen therapy there are four steps in the first step we try to achieve oxygen concentration uh, by using four different masks Firstly, nasal cannula. Through nasal cannula, we can give up to 10 liters per minute, but best performance is seen at 6 liters per minute. Maximum, it can achieve 44% of FiO2. And nextly, simple oxygen mask. 
through oxygen mask we can give up to 15 liters but best performance is seen at 10 liters and it can achieve maximum up to 60 percent of fio2 and next venture remarks uh, it can achieve maximum up to 60 percent but venture mask is a mask that is not affected by respiratory parameters that is it is not affected by tidal volume or uh, respiratory it uh, delivers by a fixed quantity of oxygen Finally, oxygen mask with reservoir, also known as non-rebreathing mask. Through this mask, we can achieve 80 to 100 percent of FiO2. See, whenever you are trying to trying to maintain saturation by using oxygen therapy, never try to get 100 percent saturation. Why? Because 100 percent saturation may lead to oxygen toxicity. Oxygen toxicity may lead to irreversible lung damage. So, never try to end up patient in oxygen toxicity so if a patient is covid infected you try to uh, achieve saturation till 96 percent if the patient is copd then you try to get saturation between 89 to 93 percent but beyond that no need uh, unnecessarily don't uh, end up the patient with oxygen toxicity whenever we try to fail in the first step then we go for second step in the second step we use high flow nasal cannula through which we can deliver 40 to 60 liters per minute and we can achieve maximum up to 100% FiO2. Some important points regarding high flow nasal cannula are it delays intubation or prevents intubation and it delivers humidified oxygen. It allows awake proning and it decreases dead space by decreasing carbon dioxide in conducting airways. As it supplies gas in high flow, it creates certain positive pressure uh, like during inspiration and peep around 4 to 6 centimeters of water. Uh, and some disadvantage of this uh, high flow nasal cannula are uh, high requirement of oxygen and nasal bleed. Whenever we try to fail during this second step, we go for third step that is uh, non-invasive ventilation that is BiPAP and CPAP. If we go, try to fill in the third, then we go for final fourth one that is mechanical ventilation. Mechanical ventilation. Uh, whenever we put patient on mechanical ventilation, there are 50-50 chances. And uh, finally, we, we go for ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Due to the effect of heart and liver, the posterior part of the lung get compressed. So, there is a mismatch in VQ ratio, ventilation coefficient ratio. So, whenever we put patient in prone position, this uh, effect of heart and liver are gone so we see a correction in vq mismatch thereby patient improves his saturation and for every 30 to 120 minutes the patient should change his position and there are certain relative and absolute contraindication for proning uh, that is uh, like uh, pregnancy uh, recent abdominal surgery spine instability uh, any facial trauma etc as lungs are rich in ACE2 receptors, initially we see pulmonary manifestation. Apart from lungs, various other organs are also rich in ACE2 receptors, leading to extra pulmonary manifestations. In that, regarding cardiac issues, we see Takatsubu cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, MI, and cardiogenic shock, and various neurological issues like headache, dizziness, encephalopathy, stroke, myalgia. And coming to renal issues, there are two major renal issues we see in COVID infection that is aka acute kidney injury and focal segmented glomerulosclerosis and in patients who are having APOL1 gene more particularly more likely to develop this FSGS and uh, Leydig cells in testes are also rich in ACE2 receptors so some recent studies and recent uh, articles saying that there might be any fertility issues uh, that is uh, due to oligospermia and impotence in males and these fertility issues are not still yet confirmed but more information is yet to come regarding for these fertility issues. Patients with older the age and underlying comorbid condition are at higher risk of developing severe illness in COVID. And now let us look at various mutations and variants of SARS-CoV-2. The virus which initially found in Wuhan city of China underwent some mutation that is, that is in spike glycoprotein at 614 numbered amino acid there is change in amino acid that is aspartic aspartic acid changes to glycine and this mutated form of virus is seen 
throughout the world predominantly but later as the time progressed a large number of mutations occurred and a new variants are found in various countries and these variants are initially named as per their lineages but later the who named uh, these variants after their greek alphabets like alpha beta gamma delta epsilon zeta theta etc the delta variant is one which is responsible for second wave of covid in india initially we named this variant as double mutated form but truly speaking we see 13 mutations in this out of 13 two are very important that made this variant for easy and rapid spread in the community recently from first week of june 2021 we come to know a new variant that is delta plus and this delta plus variant is a mutated form of delta variant and a lot more information regarding delta plus variant and lambda variant is yet to come now let us look at various diagnostic tests that is radiological and microbiological tests see in covid infection we see immune response that is antibody formation after two weeks of infection and viral load starts declining after two weeks of infection and in various samples we can find virus but for diagnostic purpose we use respiratory tract sample as valid one and in respiratory sample we use more commonly upper respiratory tract sample mm, and there are two different types of tests like direct and indirect test and indirect test is confined for only zero conversion and for recognizing past history of code infection whereas for acute infection uh, we don't use uh, indirect test and for acute infection we use direct test and in direct test we see three different types of tests like culture test rt pcr and rat test coming to the rat test that is rapid antigen test rapid antigen test is also known as point of care test see in this test we are going to target for uh, proteins like n protein and s protein and just look at the slide back to me there are three windows that is sample window testing window and control window and in testing window there is nitrocellular membrane strips to which antibodies are attached so whenever we put sample the sample flows laterally towards test testing window so this rat test comes under a type of lateral flow test and whenever in this sample antigens are present these antigens are immobilized by, by nitrocellular membrane strips so that gives pink color to or pink color in uh, testing window that indicates the test is positive rat has a specificity around 99 to 100% and sensitivity around 70% whereas rt pcr real time pcr we see sensitivity around 90% that is why uh, rt pcr is more beneficial than rat because of higher sensitivity we can detect a virus in a very low viral load conditions also now let us look at rt pcr real time pcr see in real time P pcr we come across a uh, CT value that is cycle threshold that is number of cycles done in order to identify virus gene RT-PCR targets for virus gene so for, we take a cutoff value of around 40 cycles if we are going to identify virus gene within 40 cycles the sample is considered as positive sample and if we are going to uh, uh, identify this virus gene after 40 cycles we that might be due to non-specific application so we take it as negative and in patient who are having the ct value very less that is around 10 to 15 cycles that indicates the patient had has very high viral load and in this real time pcr apart from targeting these viral genes we also look for presence or absence of rp gene rp gene is a gene of epithelial cell so the presence of RP gene indicates the test is valid and in a sample if we see the presence of RP gene and the presence of viral gene then the sample is called as valid sample and it is positive and in a sample if we see RP presence of RP gene and absence of uh, viral gene the test is valid and it is negative and in certain condition we see presence of this viral gene and absence of RP gene what does it in indicates? It indicates can, uh, the sample is invalid and contaminated and this contamination might happen by lab technician while handling two or more samples at a time. Now let us look at radiology in COVID infection. See the term CORATS doesn't indicate regarding the severity of infection in a patient. It indicates the maximum probability of having 
infection covid infection in a patient and so the ct is better option than chest x ray the aims and icmr has given certain guidelines for indication of ct why because a single ct is equal to 400 chest x rays a single ct can produce 8 milli sievert of hazardous radiation in a body so the lethal lethal dose is 50 milli sieverts per year so this ct scan is not indicated for every patient and in con conditions where the chest x-ray is failed to explain or in a normal chest x-ray and patient is cl patient clinical manifestations are suggesting of covid then we go for ct and in ct and chest x-ray we see peripheral bilateral predominantly lower lobe ground glass opacification or consolidation in covid infection see there are little difference between peri uh, ground glass opacity and consolidation in ground glass opacity we can see vessels traversing through it whereas in consolidation complete op opacification we cannot see uh, the vessels traversing through opacific opacifications right this slide back to me explains regarding the approach of imaging in covid patients now let us look at ct score ct score indicates regarding severity of infection in covid patients and radiologists give two different types of ct score like ct score around 25 and ct score of 40 in ct score 25 that depends upon lobes right lung has three lobes and left lung has two lobes o overall five lobes and for each lobe depending upon the percentage of inflammation of lobe we give a ct score of value 1 to 5 maximum if 75 percent is involved we give a ct score of 5 so for 5 lobes 5 into 5 that is ct score of 25 and depending upon this ct score we can classify uh, covid infection into mild moderate and severe and now let us look at ct score of 40 see this ct score of 40 is uh, depending upon number of bronchopulmonary segments involved uh, on the right side of lung we see 10 and left side of lung 10 there are 20 bronchopulmonary segments for each segment we give a score of 0 1 2 0 is uh, no involvement 1 less than 50 50 percent involvement and 2 for more than 50 percent of involvement of bronchopulmonary segment so overall 2 into maximum score 2 2 into 10 2 into 10 overall 40 score and Finally, we are going to end up this video here and thanks for watching my video. Thank you.